Okay, in this lab, we're going to consider the internal anatomy of birds. And we'll start with uh, muscles. Think about the basics of muscles. Each muscle has an origin and an insertion. The origin's where the, the muscle originates, usually closer to the core, proximal core of the body. And the insertion is usually the place the muscle uh, where it inserts or ends and the place that moves relatively more. The action of the muscle is the movement created by contraction of the muscle fibers. So what you need to know is names of selected muscles, where they occur, and the actions of the muscle. You don't need to know details about origin and insertion. Okay, so let's take a look then, starting with the largest muscle in the body, the pectoral muscle. Originates on the carina, or keel, on the sternum. Right, and then its insertion is in the humerus, the underside of the humerus ventrally, and it's responsible for downstroke of the wing. So, huge, powerful muscle. If you cut into that muscle when you're having your turkey or your chicken and look underneath, you'll see this muscle, the supracoracoideus. Supracoracoideus also originates on the carina or keel. Uh, a little more proximally, closer to the body. It's underneath the pectoralis, and it goes up to the upper side, the dorsal side of the humerus. Now, in this particular drawing, they actually drew it the wrong way, right in the lab manual. So it goes to the upper side of the humerus, and when this muscle contracts, it's responsible for the upstroke of the wing, pectoralis for the downstroke of the wing. If you take a look at the action of the supracoracoideus, this diagram is really good. So it shows the pectoralis uh, contracting, moving the humerus down on the left there, and the supracoracoideus contracting, squeezing, and then that raises the wings on the upstroke. Okay, so there's your action of those two muscles. Go to the forelimb. There's biceps and triceps. You know, same thing they do in our body. The biceps are responsible for flexing the elbow or, or the wing triceps for extending the elbow or wing. Now birds have a uh, expansor secondariorum and that is a muscle unique to birds running from the axilla or the armpit to the forearm and what it does is expand the secondary feathers and unlike other striated skeletal muscles of the wing the expansor is composed of smooth muscle fibers so that's kind of a neat little muscle Then we have the extensor carpi radialis, the extensor carpi ulnaris. Uh, these are basically responsible for extending the hand or manus away from the body and the flexor for flexing or folding the hand into or wing into toward the body. Okay. Now if you go down to the hind limb area, there are, are about four groups of antagonistic muscles that you should be responsible for and what they do. The quads, right? Quadriceps femoris versus the adductor. So the quadriceps is responsible for flexing the femur, pulling the femur up toward the chest. The adductor then extends the femur. And you have the sartorius versus the semimembranous muscles. Those extend and flex the tarsus. So basically bending the knee. The gastrocnemius and tibialis anterior, those two extend and flex the tarsometatarsus. So now we're down to the what's analogous to our, our foot. So pointing, you know, extending, and flexing the tarsometatarsus. And then at the very bottom, we have two muscles contradicting one another and responsible for uh, extending and flexing the digits, the extensor and flexor digitorum muscles. So that's pretty much it for the muscles that you have to know. It's not, not terribly complicated. The digestive system gets interesting. We can start right at the mouth. Um, there are some striking tongue modifications in relation to food type used. You can find birds with fleshy tongues. Um, like sap suckers, for example. Uh, look at this diagram. You can see this weird looking cinnamon teal tongue, right? You can get elongated tongues, as we talked about with woodpeckers. 
tubular tongues that are sort of roll up a little bit like hummingbirds um, and uh, fleshy sorts of tongues like that flamingos and ducks and things like that so a lot of variety right there in the mouth as you start with digestion related to the kinds of foods that birds eat if you look at salivary glands they're variable um, there's minimum digestion that starts in the mouth ca cavity but um, there's a release of tylen in some cases that helps convert starches to sugars uh, with the salivary glands and some birds like seed eaters have as many as seven salivary glands to help moisten their vegetable food. So species in general that eat moister food have fewer um, salivary glands. Those that eat drier foods have more. So you can find, for example, pelicans have no salivary glands. The salivary glands take on special functions in some species. So in woodpeckers, the tongue is coated with a sticky substance which may help neutralize formic acid. Uh, in ants that they eat, it's like flickers in particular. Our gray jay also produces a sticky mucus for seed extraction. And some swifts, like the one pictured here in the lower right, the Colocalia uh, cave swiftlet, actually use their saliva for cement in nest construction. Um, and in some cases, like this specific cave swiftlet, they use no nest material uh, at all other than their saliva. So totally made out of saliva, this nest, which is the source of oriental bird's nest soup. You go down beneath the tongue and there are some special specialized species, two or three species um, that have sublingual pouches. So beneath the tongue there's a pouch that expands and can carry as many as 150 seeds at the same time. Take a look at these pictures of this Clark's Nutcracker. Uh, the anatomy on the right and the pictures of actual Nutcracker there and, up Lolo uh, that I took at the bottom left, you can see its, its sublingual pouch is jam-packed full of ponderosa pine seeds. So these guys, rosy finches, pine grosbeaks, American goldfinch, um, all have these sublingual pouches, but pretty rare uh, among birds. These are really special. Get down into the esophagus, the passageway down toward the stomach. Most birds have some form of a crop. A crop is a diverticulum of the esophagus, an expansion of the esophagus. In general, it's better developed in birds that feed on clumped rather than dispersed food or in some cases or vegetarian diets. So if you uh, you need to feed out in the open and take cover, you may have a well-developed crop which will allow you to get into cover to do your digestion. The shape of the crop depends on diet and feeding style. There's a lot of variability. Largest crops occur in birds that eat hard to digest seeds and uh, they're distributed patchily. And as I said, vegetarians. So, you know, a crop can serve a lot like a rumen does in an ungulate. You store the food, then you go into cover, sit in the shade and, and uh, digest. So here's a bird, Watson, South America eats almost exclusively mangrove leaves and you can see it has an enlarged crop, a huge crop where it stores that vegetative material. Okay, there's another neat story. The study was done by Brooks. Um, looked at red poles, a little finch here. They're, these are tiny little homeotherms occurring in the coldest environments in Canada and up north. The crop could be a key adaptation, he argued, allowing them to deal with such cold environments. What they do is feed in three phases. They knock seeds from catkins. Um, they collect the seeds on the ground, and they carry their load to cover. So by having a crop, it allows them to gain enough food to make it through the night, A, eh? by storing a bunch of food in their crop and chewing on the food once in a while. They don't chew, but uh, d uh, swallowing food once in a while. Then it also reduces the amount of time they're exposed to potential predators while they're out in the open collecting the seeds. So it could be an adaptation to reduce predation in a sense. Pigeons have a modified crop. The lining of the crop is specialized to form what's called pigeon's milk. That's not the same as mammalian milk because there are no sugars, but there are proteins and fats and vitamins that they feed their young, regurgitating this uh, this milk. It's... Then, in some cases, a crop is used to help with display. So this greater prairie chicken uses a crop as a resonating chamber. 
air actually goes into the crop, so they may swallow some air from the pharynx. As the crop is inflated, sound from the syrinx strikes the walls of that crop and the sound resonates, you know, woo, 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 kind of things. Sage grouse inflates its crop as well, causing white chest feathers, feathers to show up. Okay. Moving on down toward the stomach. There's two parts of the stomach, the proventriculus, and which is the glandular stomach, and the gizzard, the muscular stomach. Okay, the proventriculus provides gastric juice for some chemical digestion. The gizzard, on the other hand, is responsible for macerating food, grinding the food up. And the size of the gizzard depends mostly on the hardness of the diet. So birds that eat soft foods, like birds of prey, have relatively small gizzards. While birds that eat hard foods, like seeds, have large gizzards and tough lining. Uh, and birds with well-developed gizzards also eat grit or seed, I mean, I mean sand, rocks, pebbles, which embed in the lining of the gizzard and act like teeth, helping to grind uh, food up. So grinding seed diet in particular. Now, you can get, you know, specializations in the gizzard. Some birds that eat really soft foods, like fruit eaters, have hardly well-developed gizzards at all. Just tiny little, little area of the stomach that just squeezes the, the uh, external lining of the seed and the endocarp from the seed, right? So the gizzard of something like a waxwing or a phainopepla is barely larger than the preferred berries. And what the gizzard does is simply remove the exocarp, right, but too weak to grind the seed, so only the pulp around the seed is digested, and the seed continues passing through the digestive tract unharmed. And so the plant wins because it gets dispersed, and the animal wins because it gets the endocarp. So lack of grinding saves a lot of time, so the time it takes for the seed to go in to the digestive tract and out, pass out through the bird is only about 12 minutes. There's another cool specialization of the gizzard in birds of prey, especially owls. The indigestible materials, you know, there's a lot of hair and bones and things that can't be digested. These things accumulate in the stomach and periodically are regurgitated in the form of pellets. So the little balls on the right, little pellet looking things. They're useful tools for identification of food items. So the diets of raptors is really well known because you can pick apart these pellets and identify mammals right down to the species. Moving on down the system, there's intestines. The small and large intestines are pretty much standard vertebrate issue. Uh, fat emulsification occurs in the duodenum. Nutrient absorption occurs in the jejunum and the ileum of the small intestine. So that's the role of the small intestine. Now, some birds, those that eat a lot of cellulose, like the Watson or an ostrich or something, the cows, have large cica for bacterial digestion of the cellulose. And then uh, the large intestine is responsible for storage and water reabsorption occurring there. The area that receives material from the digestive and reproductive and urinary tracts, all three, is called the cloaca. So the cloaca, that, that chamber, has three regions. The coprodeum receives excrement from the intestines. The urodeum or urodenum receives uric acid discharge from the kidney through the ureters and the egg or sperm from genital tracts through the oviductor, the vas deferens. So all three empty into the one place. And then at the bottom of the cloaca is called the proctodium, and it stores the combined excrement. Then there are strong ejection muscles that occur in the proctodium as well, so they can squish out that white, pasty substance. The vent is the opening through which uh, material passes. So the cloaca is the chamber, whereas the vent is the opening. Take a look at the heart. Birds have four chambered heart, like mammals. The four chambers represent, you know, the ability to separate deoxygenated from oxygenated blood. Uh, so deoxygenated blood comes back from body tissues, uh, then is shipped out to the lungs to get oxygenated and go back out to the tissues again. So why is it that only birds and mammals have Four chambered hearts. Um, it's thought that you know these things are costly to grow and to operate, but they can send fully oxygenated blood out to the body tissues, which is really important 
or highly active homeothermic endotherms. So if you're maintaining a high body temperature and you're really active, uh, perhaps four chamber hearts related to that. Uh, you ought to know the heart and the atria, ventricles, the aortic arch, the right and left precava. And then here's uh, arteries and veins. Yeah, you should know arteries carry blood away from the heart and are covered in smooth muscles. So they tend to be tough, thick, elastic, and have thick walls. The veins carry blood back to the heart, depend on more on skeletal muscles to help squeeze the blood through. So they have thinner walls and are, uh, have one-way valves internally. And so here are the carotid artery and the jugular vein. Now, the last thing I'll show you is a cool video that was on uh, the web where the high school teacher goes through the dissection of a pigeon. All right. Pigeon. Uh, first item on the list is the esophagus. Since it follows the mouth, the esophagus is here. This section is the esophagus. Below it is the crop. This section here that has been opened up, this is the crop. Normally, it should be covered up like so. The crop then leads down to the proventriculus, which leads to the stomach. It's this structure right here that can be found above the heart. Okay, The gizzard is down this way, underneath the right side of the liver. The gizzard is this hard structure here. This is the gizzard. Oops. <laughs> this is the gizzard. Hard structure. The intestines are these here. These are the intestines. The liver are these sections here. Hold on. What's the heart? The liver is this dark section here on both sides. Removing the liver. Pancreas is located in between the lobe of the small intestine. This is the pancreas. Cloaca is the bottom of the bird. It's the opening that is here. It leads to the inside. It's cloaca. Anus. It is simultaneously the anus and the sex organ. When birds make babies, they rub their cloacas together. Kidneys. Kidneys are in the back of the bird, against the back of the rib cage. This is the uh, bird's left kidney, and this is the right kidney. Atria and ventricle. Looking at the heart, looking at the heart, we can see, by splitting it open, we can see the atria which is the dark sections, and the ventricles, which is the light color sections. Pigeon is a four-chambered heart. The lungs can be found by following the, um, help me out here. Uh, trachea. The trachea, following the trachea, splits left and right, to the lung. Here is one lung. This right here. The other is on the other side. This is the lung. Can you lift it? This whole section that's moving is the lung. Air sac. Um, can't see it now, but the air sac was a small membrane, which is part of this. It's part of this membrane that was in this section right here. Did you ever see it filled? Uh, the bird was dead. So what when about I the pulled other side? on it, when I pulled on it, you could see that there was a cavity. On the what about the other side? On the other bird, on the other table, you can see this much better. The other side is identical, ish. I mean, is our other side intact? No, it, we've already opened this up quite a bit. But there you see the other lung, and the remnants of the air sac. Okay. This pigeon is a boy, so it has testes. And the testes are here, the light colored objects, left and right, two testes. In, in the female pigeon, you only have 
Uh, one set of ovaries. Let's go over there. Keep recording. <laughs> This being the other bird, we can see, we can see this mass as the ovaries, underneath it the oviduct, leading to the cloaca. Can you locate those air sacs that we? The air sacs oh. are here, near the lungs beneath. Air sacs.